it's my turn to present uh, my work on this project, so I'll introduce myself. Georgia <coughs> Hachpavlu, uh, I work at the Agricultural Research Institute of the Animal Production Section. And uh, today I will uh, talk to you about uh, the genetic analysis and of the association analysis of genetic loci with milk production traits in Kiev's sheep that you can see here on our vlog. And uh, so um, I'll start with the take home message from this work. And uh, luckily, it has been repeated already by Dr. Miltiado and uh, Dr. Orford. We, uh, we provide results from a novel work, so the findings are uh, novel. Since this is the first study to provide evidence for significant association between a novel polymorphism that was identified for the first time within the ACA2 gene and milk production traits in ruminants. Not just sheep, but ruminants in general. Uh, this has not been studied before, in, I, not even in cattle, as uh, Dr. Mildiad already pointed out. So, this is a new study. We have found for the first time a significant association between a new polymorphism in the gene ACA2, and it is associated with the development of the production of the gene. I won't uh, bother you much about the country gene approach. I think you've heard about it quite a, long, uh, a lot in previous talks. But this was the approach that was followed in order to first identify polymorphism in different genes. And the outcome of these genes, uh, of this uh, search, uh, was described extensively by Dr. Orford. So some polymorphisms were indeed found, found in different genes and in particular some single nucleotide polymorphisms in some genes. And the next step, the necessary step to follow these findings was to take a quantitative genetic approach. And the main question that we asked whether there is an association between the identified genetic variants, the different forms of these genes, with the observed trait variation. For example, for milk yield, if we look at how it varies among the ewes in our flock, we see great differences. We see this continuous variation, the bell shaped with slight with the tail at the end. And we want to know if the variants that we have detected associate with this difference in milk yield. Now, um, the three SNPs, uh, the three uh, genes in which we identified single nucleotide polymorphisms. The allelic frequencies of the, um, of the different uh, variants are shown here. As you can see, uh, so the, the minor allele in, in all uh, genes is quite uh, significant. The frequency is quite significant. And specifically uh, for the ACAA2 allele, so the, the polymorphism, as Dr. Rockford pointed out, is found in the 3' UTR of the gene. And the allele frequencies are quite comparable, not quite equal. So 44% of the animals in the population have the C allele, and 56% uh, have the T allele. Now, um, what do we want to do uh, with uh, uh, starting the investigation of these genes? Is to study the stiff associations with milk production traits by using a mixed model association analysis. And this procedure accounts for the genetic relationships between the animals and for the heritability of the trait, and leads to a more precise estimation of the fixed effects that we feed, among of them that of the SNP effect, which is uh, what we are interested in to estimate at this point, and also to facilitate the estimation of the SNP genotypic values, now the additive and dominance effects of each SNP on the trait. Now, this slide shows the mixed model equation employed, and in this equation there is a fixed uh, there are vectors or a matrix of fixed effects and some matrices of um, random effects. And within the fixed effects, we include the SNP genotype, which is the one that we want to estimate, along with other effects such as the season of lambing, the year of lambing, month of lambing, litter size form and lactation number in cases when we have analyzed data from multiple lactations. We also feed a covariate for the days in milk for each group. And in the random effect part, we have the polygenic effect, which is either an alima or a side effect. And in the cases when multiple lactation phenotypes are analyzed, we feed a permanent animal or retailability effect. Now, uh, we've uh, fitted 
this model to analyze phenotypes either from just the genotyped animals for each gene or from all animals for which we have phenotypes, including those with genotypes. And with the latter uh, approach, we had greater precision in estimation of the fixed effects and of the genetic variants for the trait. Now, the traits that we studied are total milk yield, fat corrected milk, which basically is the corrected total milk yield having 6% fat content as a reference, and fat percentage. And all these three traits were an analyzed separately for first lactation phenotypes or across first to third lactation. Now, in this table, you see the number of animals and records used in analysis of in each of the analyses performed. And as you can see, we utilized 318 genotype records. This is for the ACA2 analysis for uh, the other two genes. Uh, we had more genotype records, uh, approximately 350. And um, what I want you to see is that uh, we fitted a SIRE model, either for first lactation or across first to third, and then an animal model, again, for the two types of phenotypes. And the important take-home message from all these numbers is the fact that with the animal model, we were able to use many more phenotypic records and include in the pedigree a greater number of sire and dam families. Now, in this table here, you see the descriptive statistics for the three traits that we studied. And I'll just point out uh, the mean for milk, milk yield at first lactation, about 180 kilograms. And across first to third lactation, it goes up to about 219 kilograms. And you can see a uh, comparable, but a bit less um, uh, uh, num uh, li li literal numbers uh, for fat corrected milk, which is expected. And for fat percentage, we have 5% mean at first lactation and 5.552 across the three lactations. Now, let's take a sneak preview into the results as I won't have time to go into the particular outcomes for all three genes. So, the beta-lactoglobulin and prolactin variants had no effect on milk production or fat percentage. When the ACA2 SNP had no effect on fat percentage, but it had a significant effect on total milk yield and on fat corrected milk. And therefore, um, uh, we'll uh, proceed in looking extensively at the outputs of the analysis for the ACA2 gene. And I should point out that the results from the association analysis of this gene were comparable for milk yield or FCM, fat corrected milk, at least. Now, upon analyzing uh, information from all animals, including those who, that we had genotyped as well, we obtained using the mixed model analysis, uh, employing an animal model but not feeding the SNP effect in the model, we obtained accurate estimations of the genetic variance and the heritability of the traits. And as you can see here, um, uh, the heritability for first lactation milk yield is about 0.35. And this is in agreement with previous studies within the ARI flock, in other flocks of keel sheep, and across um, um, uh, other sheep breeds. And also, uh, if we look at the multiple lacta lactation estimates, we get uh, very um, comparable results to what Dr. Hazipliska showed earlier when analyzing the same information but with an entirely different method. Now, what does this 0.35 here mean? It basically means that more than a third of the observed variance at first lactation for milk yield is due to additive genetic effects. And this indicates <coughs> that uh, there's plenty of scope for uh, genetic selection to have an impact on this phenotype. Now, when analyzing uh, information from the mixed model association analysis using the animal model, and now including the SNP effect in the model. We basically obtain test statistics that show us whether the SNP has an effect on milk yield or fat corrected milk. And this test statistic, uh, both using the sire model or the animal model, is an F ratio and V 
the uh, outputs from the model are shown here, either for first lactation or across first and third lactation. And uh, along with the um, assigned or associated p-values. And as you can see, both for, uh, from the SAR model at first lactation and across first lactation or first to third lactation phenotypes, the SNP has a significant effect on milk yield. And this is the first important result that we uh, show the significant association between this SNP and uh, milk yield or fat corrected milk for which the results are comparable. And also from this analysis we obtained <coughs> predicted genotype means for each genotype class, so for the CC animals, the CTUs and the TT animals. And if we compare pairwise uh, these um, genotypic means, we observe that there are significant differences between the <coughs> genotype class values. For example, between the CC uh, genotype uh, value for milk yield and the CT, and the CC and the TT, but not between the CT and the TT. And what does, does this, what this means we'll uh, see in a bit. So from uh, the predictions of the genotype means and the allelic frequencies of the two variants of the uh, SNP uh, in, the, in the population, we can estimate the additive and dominance effects of this SNP on the trade of milk yield or on fat corrected milk. And here you can see these estimates. So there's an additive effect of about 13.4 uh, kilograms on milk yield at first lactation. And it goes down to about 10.6 kilograms if we analyze information across the first three lactations of the animals. And there's a dominant effect that is about 7.9 kilograms at first lactation and goes down to 5.3 across three lactations but we can argue that maybe this is uh, zero in a sense because the standard error is comparable. But, uh, and also we've estimated the percentage of the genetic variance that is explained solely by this SNP. And as you can see, the SNP explains about 10% of the genetic variance for first lactation milk yield and 7% across first to third lactation. And the estimates for additive and dominance effects along with the genetic variance percentage are comparable for fat corrected milk. Now, what, does, what are the implications of these findings? So rather, what does this genotype mean at first lactation milk yield really mean? Well, if we um, look at this schematic representation of the three genotype classes, along with the class mean, the genotype mean for each class, you can see that the CC animals at first lactation, they produce on average about 162 kilograms of milk. On the contrary, the TT animals produce on average about 188.4 kilograms so they produce 26.7 kilograms more milk at first lactation just based on the difference at these genetic levels. Additionally, the heterozygous animals, the CT animals, they do not lie in the middle, like of the homozygous midpoint, but in fact, uh, they are very close to the value obtained for milk yield for the TT animals. So it's actually enough to replace one of the C alleles in the animals with a T allele to get a substantial increase of milk yield. This is about five kilograms less than the TT animals and it's not uh, statistically significant. So coming to the conclusions of this part of the study, so we found that the ACAA2 T2C SNP <coughs> associates with milk yield and this association is significant at first lactation and persists up to the third lactation. And as uh, Dr. Orford also pointed out, this could be the causative locus that causes the increase of milk yield, but it could, could may well be linked to the gene that is causing uh, this change in phenotype. 
So therefore, further investigation is necessary to examine um, its, uh, uh, its actual mode of action along with these effects on other traits, other important traits for the animals before we could examine its potential use as a marker in marker assisted selection. Now, uh, for further information, you could all go to our um, published article at the Genetic Journal of Plate Science, which is actually published, uh, this one, it's out electronically, even though it's in the June issue. So, yeah, it's in June issue. Yes, yeah. so it's available online. And coming to the end, I'd like to acknowledge all the project partners for a fruitful <coughs> collaboration all this time. And also uh, uh, to thank the scientific and technical staff at the Agricultural Research Institute for managing the Kios ship flow through the years. And of course, the funding bodies for this project. And I'd like to thank you for your attention. So if you have any questions, specific questions for my work, uh, I will be glad to answer them. I would like to congratulate all the speakers. <laughs>